Professionals in the horticulture arena often turn their hands to projects that challenge on a large scale. Vertical gardens, green facades, roof garden technologies and the like. One such professional is botanist Eric van Zylikon. How would you describe what you do? My role is to bridge the gap between botany, horticulture and ecology. I design living architecture systems and those are technologies that are applied to buildings. I pretty much take plants and put them on buildings, on structure. And what that means is my job is to find plants and ecologies that will work well in the urban sphere. I'm drawing on species from niche environments, niche ecologies. They haven't been studied, there's very little data, and so I have to conduct a lot of that research myself. Eric has continued that research after moving from Melbourne to Brisbane with his family two years ago. And over the last two years, Eric's been experimenting, growing new plants for his innovative work in his own backyard. Well, Jerry, this is an example of one of the pioneer canopy species we're working with. It's a very rapid growing Brazilian fern tree, Schizolobum parahybra, and this was planted by seed two years ago. Wow. Remarkable growth. It's got the largest compound leaf of any tree, and the idea is for it to quickly ascend, produce shade for the trees below, but also to be a host for our aroids. So what are you learning about these philodendrons? Well, the first thing is I'm exercising reading a plant. And in this case, we've got a great example of a plant with leaves that are heavily fenestrated, meaning they've got big gaps between them, and that tells you that it most likely is trying to conserve moisture. So it possibly comes from a very dry environment or low humidity environment. The trunk thickens as it climbs up, but what's happening here is that the exposures are talking to the plant's genetics and stimulating it to conserve a bit of moisture for in case it's a dry period, but because it's in the shade, it doesn't feel too stressed. It doesn't have to go too far with being succulent. So in this case, it's putting on a lot of vertical growth, but retaining quite a thin trunk. Here, Jerry, we have exactly the same species grown in dramatically different environments. The exposures are higher full sun and higher wind. As you can see from the base all the way up, it's grown and thickened dramatically, become very succulent. And that'll allow the plant, when it goes deciduous, through a dry winter where it comes from, that it can survive those periods of stress. So what this is telling me as a gardener is that in this one plant, standard care does not really apply. In fact, this would do really well in dry temperate Perth, as it does here in subtropical Brisbane. It's really adaptable. It certainly is. Well, Jerry, this is the next chapter in our story. It's the long-term goal. We're going to be establishing a edible rainforest here. We're modelling it on how a rainforest naturally evolves. So we've got pioneer species, frontline species that will grow really rapidly and produce protective open canopy that allows a lot of light through, and then a secondary canopy of slower growing emerging species that are our fruiting species. And the idea behind this is not only is it going to help feed the family, it's going to host my botanical collections, my research plants. And another corner of this botanist playpen holds more areas for experimentation. So what do we have here? Jerry, we've got three shade houses. They house my research plant collections. I'd like to remind you that they're not prettified collections. They are hardcore research, but we've got one that I can control humidity, one that I can introduce plants to ambient conditions, and then the third one is my two hard basket where work and life get in the way and it overflows into that one. Can we have a look? Absolutely. The important thing for me here is to deliberately stress plants, to push them to their outer parameters, their outer tolerances, and to observe how they respond in a closed environment like this. My job is to observe these plants in habitat and to find ways to translate what I see happening in rainforests into living architecture projects. So there's an awful lot going on just in this one space. And the plants themselves are changing the conditions for how their partner plants next to them also grow. And you're keeping records of all Absolutely. this as you go. Absolutely. All the competition, all the uh, heats and stresses. Wow. 
But it's not all work and no play. Eric still finds time to tend their family veggie patch. This is what we use to feed the family. As you can see, we have quite a few different plants, herbs and vegetables, as well as flowering beneficials. So how was the gear shift coming from cool temperate Melbourne to subtropical Brisbane? It was quite a gear shift, but a pleasurable <laughs> one at that. We got to discover new foods, new herbs and spices, tropical and Asian foods that we really enjoy too. We expanded our food palette that we eat, and one great example is this moringa. I grow it as a hedge to stop the wind racking through the garden, yeah. but we're also able to just simply pull the leaves, we can eat it fresh, put it to pestos, or we dehydrate it. And we discovered you can eat green bananas. And not only that, we use them as a soil builder through our gardens as well. Brilliant. Eric, your garden is just two years young, and yet it's a testament to your ability to read the climate and to read your plants. Mm, thank you. I think one of the important things is to remember that what's on the label is important, but to peer beyond that, to look at the life story of the plants behind it. And when you, you understand that story, then it certainly simplifies gardening and makes it a lot easier to apply them. Well, I just think it's wonderful to meet somebody who practices what he preaches and who leads by example. Thank you so much.